All right, John, another director's cut. Terrence Malick tonight. Man, I feel really prepared for this show. It was a really long holiday break, though. I wonder if Jason had a good holiday. I wonder if he ate anything good. More importantly, I wonder if he drank anything good. I mean, did he love it? What is love? What are, what are feelings? I mean, what are we all doing? What does it all mean? We're just an infinitesimal speck crashing through the dark. John. That is. Oh. Hey, John. Yeah. And, are you yeah, doing one of those Terrence Malick style introspective voiceovers? Knock it off. We got a show to record. Let, let's get it going, man. Sorry. Happy New Year. Welcome back to Director's Cut. That's right. We took the holidays off, but we're back finally reviewing the director, the prof prophetic, the, I don't, I don't even know what to call him. We're going to get into all of that, but that is Terrence Malick. So I'm joined today by my go my, my ghost host. Jesus Christ, John. The ghost host with the most. <laughs> Say my name three times and I'll pop up on your diorama and grab my crotch. It's me, <laughs> Beetle Jason. <laughs> That's, that might stay in. Uh, yeah. What's up, Jay? Uh, you had a, you had a holiday, like. I did, but in a different place. How was yours? Oh, I had so many holidays. I'm actually not done. It's it's early January, and I haven't done my third of three Christmases yet. That's what happens when you have uh, divorced parents and you have in-laws. So you just get to do all the Christmases, which is great if you have a little three-year-old that loves to run around and open everybody's presents for them. So yeah, she's been enjoying that. I enjoyed the time off of my job of stay-at-home dad. Uh <laughs> And writer, I guess. I didn't really get the time off. So, uh, and then just doing the research for this, which I really liked. So it's been good. How were your holidays, sir? Uh, they were good. We have, we only have like a little bit of family up here since we moved to the uh, PNW. I do have one of my millions of children that I, that I have uh, spawned. Her birthday is on the 26th. So that's, it's like Groundhog Day as far as the holiday goes. In, that's so bad for a kid oh i'm so man i'm on the 20th so it's and i don't care like i'm old and it doesn't matter anymore but yeah. but by the time like december's over we are just like done it's just so much but on the 26 is like i just got you presents <laughs> <laughs> but you, you have can't. a savings bond yeah you, ha you have to you have to celebrate it though because you just think about how she feels i mean it's kind of her fault but whatever our my, my sons do mid-may so we might just do a joint birthday. <laughs> <laughs> All but, I got was cupcakes on my date. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it was February 1st. I'm not buying you presents on February 1st. Yeah. And, and New Year's is just the worst holiday. Like if you ever worked in like hospitality field, especially when I, I was like a suit in the hospitality industry, I literally had someone like throw up on me. Uh, so I always had to like, like while I was working, I always had to clean up the mess from New Year's. So I just hate it. So I was uncharacter uh, uncharacteristically sober for New Year's. So my wife and I just stay home and eat terrible snacks and watch terrible television. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, I'm I'm now back on the horse, uh, and I'm. This is a good segue to introduce my beer tonight. Uh, that is the Fremont Sister. This is an Imperial Double IPA. It is an eight point nine percenter. Ooh. Uh, yeah. Uh, I've had the brother before, but I heard the sister uh, fights even harder. So, who is your special guest tonight? Oh, uh, that would be Mister Boss Tweed, the unfiltered Old Nation IPA. It's a nine point three percent. It's made with four kinds of dry hops, four kinds of boil hops, and uh, three kinds of malt. So uh, this uh, kicks like a real bitch. It's got a lot of sediment in there. Ooh. So you either roll the can or you just uh, dump it in a glass and leave that last little bit for, uh, I don't know, for all the sediment in the bottom. But this uh, this beer doesn't mess around. Old Nation makes a, an unfiltered IPA called M43 that's very popular. But if you can get the boss tweed, it's even better. And uh, you can't get the boss tweed because basically um, it doesn't keep. So they can't really distribute it that widely. So basically you get it in Michigan and that's like it. So everyone's going to be envious. They don't get to taste this delicious brew, but I don't know what to tell you, man. There are some benefits to living in a place with uh, more breweries than people and a low cost of living. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Prost. Prost. Yes. Lachaim, uh, Lestrovia, all the things. 
That's refreshing. That is a nice uh, golden hue on that. That looks like that really, uh, yeah. really kicks. I like a nice double IPA. Yeah, I, I do too. Like actually, the the higher, the double, the triple, I, I tend to like uh, more than the single. Uh, yeah, this is this is fantastic. I've been drinking a lot of like, you know, it's the holidays and around that around that time. So I've been drinking a lot of Porter stouts or hazy IPA. So this is just a nice, clean, refreshing double. See, I, I'm not as punk rock as you, man. Like if there is floaties in my beer, I will pour it out. I know, I know that I'm wrong, but I just, it, it freaks me out, man. Look at that. Look at that haze. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. You could literally chew on that like gum. Ah, hmm. All right. Well, I think single IPAs have become the pumpkin spice latte for dudes. I agree. Uh, cit like c citrus too, right? Yeah. This is our orange peel super lemon zest. Uh, I, I like that in a summer beer, so let's not poop on that too much. Sure. Uh, My favorite summertime beer has got uh, orange peel and coriander, and it's uh, fantastic. Actually sounds really great. All right. So movies you guys came for, you guys and gals came for the movies, uh, and Terrence Malick, oh boy. Uh, so I, I think we should just... We just got to set the stage. Uh, and so I'm just going to, if you guys aren't familiar with Terrence Malick films, there's not that many of them. Uh, so over a 45, 46 year career. Right. The man doesn't have much time left to make more. So uh, although he's trying, he pumps out a new one every, every year. So here we go uh, with a scant resume, but a long list of award wins and nominations. Director Terrence Malick chooses carefully the stories he wants to tell and the way he wants to tell them. His career as a director officially began with a short film called Lanton Mills in 1969, but his feature film debut 1973's Badlands about two young lovers who embark on a killing spree was an impressive opening salvo as we've seen from any director that we've covered thus far. In 1978's Days of Heaven, a tense, dusty film about a pair of desperate lovers who pretend to be brother and sister to bilk an old farmer out of a fortune was loved by critics and the cinematographer Nestor Alamandros uh, won an Oscar for his work on the film. Many thought we'd seen the last of Malick as he didn't direct another film for 20 years, but he came back strong with 1998's critically acclaimed WW2 pick The Thin Red Line, which earned a whopping seven Oscar nominations but came up short having been released the same year as Spielberg's harrowing World War II epic. Saving Private Ryan, seven years later, Malick's aesthetically pleasing but ultimately forgettable Pocahontas fable, The New World, barely made its budget back but earned cinematographer Emmanuel Lebesky an Oscar nod. His first for his work on a Malick project, but not his last, as 2011's The Tree of Life earned him another. Somewhat baffling to audiences, The Tree of Life struggled to make half of its budget back domestically, but worldwide audiences were much more receptive to the esoteric and highly stylized film heavily influenced by Dostoevsky, the brothers Kyra Matsov. After an uncharacteristically short break of less than a year, Malik's 2012 effort to the wonder struggled to gain any traction with audiences despite an all-star cast and its release was extremely limited. Undertiered Malik's actor with a GoPro shot freeform film Night of Cups from 2015 was his most dreamlike and confusing film to date and was given another limited release, but has become a bit of a cult classic among fans of Malik's style. Preferring to stick to limited releases in 2017, Malik released a gorgeous frenetic film about intersecting love triangles called Song to Song. Film back to back with Night of Cups, Song to Song featured several actors from Night of Cups, but in typical Malik fashion, those appearances ended up on the cutting room floor. So as we do on this show, Jason, we try to talk more about the filmmaker themselves, but God, that's a little hard to do because this man is a little bit elusive. He, um, it's kind of funny. We did this like right back to back uh, with uh, another very elusive filmmaker who uh, kind of developed a bit of a cult of mythos surrounding him based on his, like extreme reluctance to give interviews or do any press. Oh, it, but at least Kubrick uh, came out of the woodwork sometimes, at least later on. He did a couple interviews. Uh, the only time you see Malik is they saw him on the side of the road walking kind of somewhat drunkenly with uh, Benicio del Toro, completely a ghost. Uh, why? I don't know. Like you hear him talk. Uh, like he did an interview for uh, Song to Song at South by Southwest with um, the. German guy. Um, God, what's his name? I can't even think. Fassbender. 
Fassbender. Michael Fassbender. He he's did. not German. I thought he was English. No, he's Fassbender. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's German. Is he really German? Oh shit, he's German. Yeah. But yeah, he they did an interview with South by Southwest. He was talking a little bit. He just sounds like a guy. Uh, what is it about? Him? Does he just want you know his privacy? What do you think the deal is with with Malik? I don't think he wants us speculating. <laughs> if he's that private, I think the last thing he wants is us trying to guess why he's private. I don't think he's got little boys in cages. So barring that, I really don't care what he's up to. Um, I don't know. He's he's a little bit enigmatic, but like he he has his style. And um, boy, I'll tell you, Badlands was as good a first movie as we've seen from anybody. The best we've covered. We've had a, a couple really good first movies. I, I think Badlands was as close to a perfect movie, arguably his best movie in his in his catalog. And for a first time effort, Jesus, I know he was doing little stuff before. But this is his first feature. I mean, I, I think you could put that up against anything that we've reviewed. Well, he wrote a few things, but his this he did a short as a director. This is his first feature. So, I yeah. mean, it was uh, real solid. So was, was the cast uh, at that time uh, pretty, pretty well known, I would assume, right? It was the 70s. I mean, yeah, this wasn't like Martin Sheen or Sissy Spacek's first movie, you know? wasn't even really all that close so it's not like he was casting unknowns he he somebody gave him money you know so yeah. she i mean she was quite young in this film and i think that's kind of the the taboo uh part of it is that it was this kind of uh thelma and, not thelma and louise but a, like a bonnie and clyde story but but the fact is she it's a little lolita ish as well uh which is yeah really kind of made it that much more dangerous but i mean it's just a brutal ass movie i mean it's full sp i mean spoilers alert for something that's older than both of us you know fathers are getting murdered right away and she's just like yeah I'm, I'm along for the ride it's all about i guess true love you could say in a in a cheesy way to kind of sum it up but or maybe the naivete of youthful infatuation sure because she really went along with uh, whatever he was about, you know, as horrifying as it was. But the whole time she does have that kind of caged animal demeanor about her because she, you know, she does try to escape at the at the first sign uh, of a chance. To escape. She, she's very smart. I, I, it seemed very savvy, although she did love him and she was going along for the ride as soon as there was an opportunity opportunity that she felt was necessary to leave she took it so uh this is probably his best written film too uh, you know spoiler alert during the rest of the episode i'm not a big fan of terrence malick dialogue what dialogue i know ha -ha. he doesn't he increasingly doesn't think scripts are important so he went from <laughs> overproducing movies to the point where like director like production companies got impatient with how long he was taking and shut him down, which is why he didn't finish a movie in 20 years to like, Hey, Christian Bale, here's a GoPro. Go make my movie. <laughs> Go walk around. Hey, Olga Karolinko, just spin around in, in the mess. Yeah. That's, that's your movie. You could jump in like six hotel pools and then come back and just give me the footage. <laughs> that'd be, that'd be great. Yeah, he probably I won't wouldn't use care. any of this shit. I'm going to cut all of it, but just go do it. Yeah. Go drive around. And if you feel like having a conversation, have it <laughs> oh, like, man, like what did you do exactly you got a writing credit for a movie where you didn't do shit <laughs> but it's kind of i'm struck by the um the quote from uh from kierkegaard he said life must be lived forward but can only be understood backward i feel that way about his movies if you watch his movies in reverse order i feel like it makes more sense i feel like he kind of knew what he wanted when he made badlands but like where he ended up makes a lot of sense because a lot of his themes, like he believes them to the point where they changed how he makes movies. If that makes any sense. Oh, it totally does. It, it feels like he almost had that John Carpenter arc with, or, or relationship with, uh, with Hollywood. Cause he was so in it in Badlands. He was into it in days of heaven. He was so into it. 
He even put himself in the movie. He's an actor in the in the film. And then, yeah, it's just whatever happened uh, behind closed doors, he got so disillusioned and just so done with it. Um, I don't I've I did a lot of reading because I was like, why was there a 20 year gap? And then you look online and people on Reddit and Yahoo and communities like that are like, why did this dude not make a movie for 20 years when Days of Heaven and Thin Red Line were both really good? And all I found was this one like really long article that had just a a few of the things that he, the projects that were abandoned, some of the writing he did, but really, I don't know if he was disillusioned as much as just couldn't make it happen. And I don't think he was going to make a movie just to make a movie. He wasn't going to make a movie for a paycheck. Cause I think he was getting paid enough to write that he just wanted to, Make the movie he wanted to make, and I maybe the Thin Red Line is the movie he wanted to make. I don't, I don't actually know. I, I think the movies he wants to make are the movies he's making every year now since 2015. He's made, you know, 2016, 2017. I think the next one's coming out this year. Uh, I, I think those are the movies he wants to make now. Because think about it, I, I think he could have been. He has stylistically. Visually, he's on. You could put him up against any filmmaker a- out there. Uh, I mean, think about stylized filmmakers. Edgar Wright. Uh, we we just you know reviewed Stanley Kubrick. You could put him. Reffin. Re- Reffin. Uh, <laughs> you could put him up against any of those guys, and he, he's flawless, right? He makes a beautiful screensaver esque film. It's just he just doesn't know what else to do. And he's just, I think I feel like he might be so much of a weirdo that he doesn't get the right people to that. Or maybe he scares people off. This is the most baffling uh, filmmaker. I think that we've had. So I think that the new world was a pivot point for him in the way he made movies. Cause I think the thin red line was such a joyless slog to edit. Because he shot so much and it ended up so long and he cut out the main character and like framed the whole thing around a different protagonist than he intended. Like Kavisa wasn't even really supposed to be the central character. Right. Uh, And you could argue that like that's how kind of ended up. I think the new world was like the the thin red line he wanted to make. I think that it was a better setting for it. And I the movies basically thematically are identical. Um, but more once more you strip coherent. out, what's that? M- more coherent though. Like uh, the new world yeah. is so streamlined. Yeah, since Badlands, that's his most streamlined. Fi- or or maybe Days of Heaven too. Those are very, you know, you're you're watching a film. It has progression, natural stuff. Uh, once you got to the thin red line, there's a beautiful, perfect film in that in there. Uh, then he just decides to insert Chanel number no. nine commercials. Uh, in his in his movies and it's just so confounding uh, where like you said the new world has a better setting to go along with that kind of style and, and talk about you know as far as nature shots that's when he's at his best um, well, I, I don't think stylistically he did it different I think the story he wanted to tell was better set because he, he very carefully chooses the the kind of story he wants to tell and tells it the way he wants to he's a very philosophical filmmaker and he tries to use visual metaphor to, to do a lot of uh, complicated concepts. I think the thin red line was a mess. It was a good movie the way it ended up, but it wasn't the movie he wanted. And I think he was so frustrated that he tried to make that same story. Cause when you, I feel like he had this whole story with Adrian Brody and he's like, I don't want to tell that. I wanted to tell the story about, what we lost when we sort of abandoned tribal community living. Sure. So like the way the, the movie starts out, the thin red line starts out, they're kind of in that tribal setting. And I think the new world better told that where it's sort of like you're allowed to be a more complete person and experience the greater range of your own emotions and feelings and live a more, contented life connected to other people. And so you don't really get the sense that 
abandoning the military unit life to go live with those villagers was an indictment of the sort of regimented Western society. Um, it's not as obvious because you think, oh, those guys just don't want to go get shot up because that's why they're AWOL. Right. So I feel like the New World told that story more coherently, and I, I feel like it was his do-over for Thin Red Line, which worked well as a, a war film, but I think that was an accident almost <laughs> is that because like the movie he ended up with wasn't really what he started out making. I yeah. think he found the story of the new world inside filming the thin red line, which is a book adaptation. It, it, it bears mentioning. So the, the whole Pocahontas story, I think what did John Smith find that he liked better, you know, uh, about that sort of communal living. And it wasn't just that, you know, that he wanted to have sex with a teenager. Yeah. Which I'm sure, you know, there's there's something to that, too. Um, That's an ongoing theme in his films. Apparently, shit. Um, Kubrick, too. Yeah. Uh, I think it was more like he felt like a more complete person. He said, like, the only thing, part of my life that was real was with you in the woods. He said to Pocahontas, and uh, they forgot about each other. And that's that's messed up too, you uh, know? It, it's a very true adaptation, though, which a lot of, you know, you think of the Disney route of, of Pocahontas is just like, oh, they fall in love forever. It's like, no, she got on the boat, found someone else, and then died shortly after. It's not a not a happy ending. But think about just the thin red line for a second. Like, if, if it, the movie was just really all, like, think about, like, a smaller movie set all in that prairie scene, and it was, like, 90 minutes clean, God, that's the best war film. I think that beats Saving Private Ryan that came out that year. But it was just so full it's, of stuff. Yeah, it's tough. And I was thinking, man, he made a mistake. 20 years he could have released that movie at any time. He had to release it the same year Saving Private Ryan. Right. But if you look, the year before, Titanic would have beat him. And the year after, American Beauty would have beat him. So, like, I don't... I think Titanic is not a great movie. I don't think Titanic is a better movie than this, but it panders to the right audience. But I think audience. it's yeah. it, it appeals more broadly, and it was it, it was an epic. You know, Titanic was just one of those movies. This is like, yeah, we're done. You know, so and then American Beauty the next year that that might be one of the the most effective movies ever made. So he was kind of screwed. He had to, he went up against Saving Private Ryan and ultimately lost because I think Saving Private Ryan was more evocative. Like nobody, no World War II vet left the thin red line vomiting. Right. Right. And I think the hyper realism, the fact that Spielberg stripped all the color out of the movie to make it seem bleaker and just the fact that it was not a metaphor for war. It was just like, here's World War II. Didn't that suck? Well, and that's the thing. I think it's almost unfair to compare the two because, yes, they're both World War II films, but like you said one is a complete metaphor for the war yes it shows actual scenes and and whatnot but it's more about the idea of, of war and, and it's it's the meta it's the metaphor for all wars yeah nick nolte is insufferable though <laughs> like i was he was like nailed was, on a shock a good character everyone. what's the what's the war in the heart of nature why does nature vie with itself if i think he made a mistake he, I think he set out to make the thin red line, but what he wanted to make was ultimately the new world. And um, so you take that Kierkegaard quote, and if you understand his filmography backwards, uh, I, I think the tree of life was where he really kind of established what he was about. And that is the most polarizing movie, not only that he made, but I think it's possibly one of the most polarizing movies anybody's made. I completely agree with you. I think you hated it. I, okay. So I, I think again, like a thin red line, uh, the thin red line that drives me crazy when people say a thin red line. Um, well, there the is a quote. There's a thin red line between. Yeah, there you go. Uh, there's, a, there's a beautiful, perfect, oh, near perfect film in the tree of life. You just have to get through all this stuff to get to it. You have to di really dig deep. All the stuff with the family is great, but then he goes on these weird, you know, uh, philosophical tangents and belligerent, like 
introspection that just doesn't that was the movie in. that was the movie the other stuff was see you thought that the stuff i thought was the movie was the distraction right and i thought that this what you thought was the movie he should have hacked down to was a framing device for actually telling the story he told no no but if you if i wanted to watch that i would just watch a voyage of time which i did and that's fine I, if i want to see visuals about dinosaurs and the creation of, of the universe and all this stuff with the voiceover uh listening to terrence malick think he that you know he thinks he knows what he's talking about and all this stuff then that's fine then a voyage of time is your film but i didn't need that coupled with you did it was like eating a peanut butter and a thumbtack sandwich it was just bizarre that was like eating a peanut butter and nutella sandwich and you're like well i just want a nutella well, too bad. <laughs> I, dude, I, I, seriously, I get it. Like the the whole dinosaur in the beginning, and he steps on the other one's head, and then he makes that conscious choice, and that sets everything in in the motion, and it's all very yes. Every every film he made is about a dichotomy. If right, you, right. and you have to watch his later movies to understand that. I almost, I almost went back and rewatched Badlands in the context of all the other films. I, I jumped around chronologically. Yeah. Like there's no good way to watch someone's filmography if you've only seen two of their movies. So I almost went back and rewatched Badlands and almost maybe even Days of Heaven after that. Just once you figured out the central thesis to what he's doing is and and he wanted to make the tree of life in the 70s. And when you realize that, this is his dogma, right? It wasn't the first movie he made, but it was the first story he ever wanted to tell. Right. The central thesis to why you need the two brothers and their distant father, whose philosophy was completely at odds with their mother, was it's the it's the dichotomy of grace versus nature, right? Right. So you go back and you rewatch the Thin Red Line. That's not a U.S. versus Japan. It's not a tribalism versus collectivism it's not a it's a grace versus nature you know like even the bird that he's shown with its wing blown off that yeah. would cut a stray bullet kills other animals the crocodile in the beginning you're like oh shit crocodile scare the hell out of me right but then you see it completely like the crocodile isn't shit right like there's always a more destructive force it's the dichotomy of grace versus nature and that's at the heart of every story he wants to tell. He he thinks of things in very black and white terms, it seems. You're either Mr. Grace kind of swimming in the ocean or you're Mr. Nature wandering around the desert, a, a literal actual <laughs> desert, staring up at the sun, feeling lost and wondering how you can find your way back. Everything's a dichotomy. And once you grasp that about the tree of life and why they needed the 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 husband versus wife brother versus brother sort of story at the heart of it you needed both halves of your peanut butter thumbtack sandwich i'm sorry <laughs> man the thumbtacks are what held the script to the wall so you could read it I, I, what script i buy i buy oh, <laughs> hey this isn't his last four movies right, right i know <laughs> i buy all this for a dollar except if his introspection voiceovers uh, you know explaining uh, all of this right to, to me because i'm the i'm the idiot that's just like just give me the stuff about the family i don't need the all this fluff uh <laughs> if it wasn't done in such an elementary way like he literally explains everything in disembodied voice and i'm just because like, he doesn't trust the audience he doesn't trust anybody like because he made a bunch of movies he made the thin red line and he made the new world and we didn't goddamn get it because we thought the thin red line was about the u.s versus japan he's like no you don't <laughs> get it yeah. it was a great harrowing war film it wasn't a war film you such idiots right and right. then he does the and he does too much goddamn voiceover too much. That's uh, one thing, because it's like, just let me. If you're going to let Christian Bale just shoot a lizard with a GoPro, you don't have to explain <laughs> shit. If that's your movie, if there's no script, 
You don't need to do voiceover, asshole. Just let the movie speak for itself. Put it on YouTube and, at that point. It's just like, what do you? Why? Why are you doing this? Um, I, 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 I think that's, I think that's a mistake. But also, I, he feels like if he doesn't do the voiceover and hold our hand, if he doesn't show the rat scrambling on the the banister, we're not going to get it. <laughs> Listen, uh, he. Let's flash forward a little bit to to where he really gets into his own mess. Knight of Cups is, I get it. It's like an ambient film. Let me tell you, a <laughs> film like, ambient film. Uh, it's so ambient because I just had I it watched on it on mute movie. for an hour and didn't even realize. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's just you. It's a. It's the music, the brainless music that you just put in the background while you're vacuuming because you don't care that the vacuum is making too much noise to hear it. I was doing everything to try to hold my attention to the screen while Night of Cups was going on. If you want to make an ambient film or something heady like that, go look at David Lowry, who is like 29 years old. He made a ghost story. That is how you make an ambient film where you just it, it shows, you know, people sitting in rooms. Yeah, but something happens. And then and then the director gives you time to kind of absorb it and to and to really get into the to the emotion and the feeling and and they don't say anything it's just it shows something or someone says one thing and then you you just kind of have to deal with that i mean for shit's sake there's like 20 no i think it's eight minutes total of uh rooney mara eating a pie uh, but it's it's effective and it works because you don't have some dopey guy going well, I was in love once. What is love? Love is a feeling that you get when your mother bakes you an apple pie. It's just like, Jesus, like, just let me watch it and let me form he my can't. own opinion. No, he can't. can't. And it's not his fault. It's our fault. <laughs> not I our feel fault. so bad for Terrence Malick because he can't tell us the stories he wants to tell us because we're all such dipshits. <laughs> And we turn off Night of Cups 10 minutes into it and go watch the Avengers. Well, yeah. I mean, are we wrong? <laughs> oh, if man. you are in that headspace, so I would like to take some LSD and watch To the Wonder, Night of Cups, and Song to Song all in a big old bender. You cannot pay me. Uh, I think that would be. I think that would be the way to appreciate those movies. Inebriated or not, to the wonder was like to the wonder and Night of Cups is a never. I would never, ever, ever pay me. No, I, I couldn't. To the wonder. It and let me just say, these are not. He is not a bad filmmaker by any stretch of the imagination. He is a brilliant filmmaker. This is why I'm so heated because everything looks perfect. I mean. To the Wonder is just, he makes a backyard in Texas look gorgeous. Look Looks like a destination where you want to go spend your time and your money, but it's there's just nothing. It's just fluff and stuff for 90 plus minutes, and there's just nothing to it. You're just mad he cut Rachel Wise out of it. <laughs> Was she supposed to be in it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. She got cut out. <laughs> gotcha. Is this where we bring up the Christopher Plummer? Thing. So you worked with Terry Malick once, didn't you? Yes. The problem with Terry, which I soon found out, is that he needs a writer. And then he edits his films in such a way that he cuts everybody out of them. You know the oh, story of yes. you know, right. Adrian Brody, Brody yeah. didn't going, even know. going to the premiere and he was not the seeing lead. himself on the He was the lead writing. in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote Terry a letter. I gave oh, you him did? Him. Yeah, I gave him a shit. Yeah. Yeah. Did you write I'll never work with him again. Of course, <laughs> my career with Mr. Malick is over. Hey man, <laughs> Christopher Plummer wasn't. Dude, there are two hundred and fifty-five POV characters in Thin Red Line. And you don't have time for Christopher Plummer's ass. He was into the Wonder though. Or no, yeah. not, he was in the New World. That's right. Maybe he was supposed to be in the Thin Red Line. I don't. I forgot which movie he got cut out of because he got cut out of it. Do, do you have the quote handy? I, I know he said he was. In, he was. He had a like Captain Newport had a a, a decent sized role in New World, but. I thought he was mad that he got cut out of Thin Red Line, and that's why I just never saw him. But he was in New World. That's right. I, I don't remember the quote. I didn't write it down, but he was just sort of like, eh, I'm not going to work with him again. Uh, he said he would never, ever work with him again. Uh, you can see this on YouTube. It's this, they, they interviewed like a panel of 
uh, actors that have worked with Terrence Malick and Christopher Plummer just holds no punches. He just thinks he's just terrible. He's like, Terry's a, you know, visually he's great, but you, you go like, think about how frustrating that might be to go to a job, uh, you know, do all this stuff. And then you might not even be featured for anything. I mean, some of these actors, well, if you're doing the, the movie for money, you're like, yeah, whatever check clears. But if you're sure. Christopher Plummer and don't need them, the money, it might piss you off. He's a thespian. He wants to be featured, right? Yeah. Oh. Well, there's there were just too many people. The movie was too. It was the wrong setting, which is why when you did the Tree of Light uh, or the uh, the New World, there's ten characters in that movie. He's like, this is much better. <laughs> yeah, Th- Thinner Alliance. Like, is that John Cusack too? Like, John, yeah, John C. Riley or Johnny Riley or whatever. Elias like- Coteus. He was great in the. He was my favorite part of the film. Well, Elias Coteus is super underrated. What are you gonna do, man? He just doesn't get to do cool shit. Woody Harrelson did a, has a great part in that film. I think Woody Harrelson sucks in that film. So. He blows off his own ass. <laughs> <laughs> that seems right. If that seems very like realistic in real life, Woody Harrelson is in your your troop. He's the guy that's gonna blow off his own ass. Yeah. Uh, the... So yeah, I... I'm sorry. I just I got caught up looking at all the cool shit that Elias Cateus has done over the years. He's Casey Jones, man. Casey motherfucking Jones. Yeah. He taught those Japanese dudes how to play hockey. <laughs> Ninja Turtles three is the one we had on VHS. So my brother always wanted to watch Turtles three. So I've seen that more than the other two combined. And the other two were the good ones. That's true. I love Ninja Turtles two had that turtle rap. <laughs> <laughs> vanilla ice go ninja go ninja go but no i had to see the one where they traveled back in time to feudal japan Oof. and then don tells like whoa i can't get a cappuccino or whatever cory feldman <laughs> whatever cory Feldman. i don't think he was looking for maybe another <laughs> stimulant <laughs> back then. what do you mean methamphetamines won't be invented for another 250 years <laughs> this is japan right where's the opiates uh <laughs> yeah right, feldman Song to okay, so so I've been crapping on this poor guy for so long. Uh, but song to song, I I actually liked. I that actually... was Knight of Cups. He oh. shot those movies at the same time. He shot those movies so back to back. Christian Bale had a huge part in Song to Song, which got <laughs> cut. It got cut because he was hanging around the set of Song to Song because he thought he was in it. I guess I don't know. Yeah, because it it showed like every single scene. Uh, because she's. I mean, we're trying. I'm trying to. Uh, to say what the plot was to one of these films, which is just impossible. But uh, Rooney Mara's character is like an aspiring musical artist. And, and you see her up on stage a lot, like trying to play with the band and all the GoPro scenes. You see Christian Bale walking around is in that area. So apparently he was going to do something uh, in, in. He was going to cross him over. Yeah. in this concert setting um, because yeah. his, his character, he was a film producer, right? In Night of Cups. Or like a screenwriter or something. I liked it. Whatever. You liked what? You liked Knight of Cups? Yeah. What did you like about it? There was they didn't say anything. it was just Christian Bale looking confused. Yeah, but like it was philosophically the the point he's trying to make. And I don't necessarily agree. Of, I think you have to be super religious to think everything's a dichotomy. And he clearly is to the point where he felt like he had to shoehorn a possible atheist explanation for the tree of life or an atheist interpretation just to not look preachy. I think he is a little preachy. And I appreciate the point he's trying to make, even if I don't per se agree with the whole dichotomy argument. But if you look at, if you live his discography or his filmography chronologically, but I understand it backwards. I think you can, if you go back through after you kind of come around on tree of life, I think you can appreciate to the wonder night of cups and song to song a lot. If you come around on tree of life. And I think you can appreciate the thin red line and the new world a little bit more too. Because what he's th- he's talking about connectivity. People are profoundly isolated these days. People feel alone, surrounded by people and 6,000 followers on Twitter and, you know, 150 likes on your Facebook po- photos. And we're living in more crowded cities. 
but people feel increasingly isolated and unconnected in a way that they haven't before to the point where we're like, we're giving people mushrooms just so they feel like they're part of something. You know, people experience psychological trauma and feel alone and terrible. And I think, I think if we didn't leave our parents' house and not move our grandparents back in with us and, you know, the, the benefits to tribal living, I think we abandoned all of that. And I think there are consequences to that. There's stuff we missed. And I think all of his movies are maybe since, uh, since the thin red line anyway, or I've been about that, about what we, about what we've lost abandoning. And that's maybe what he figured out for those 20 years where he wasn't really producing anything. He was coming to grips philosophically with, with those kind of themes that are throughout all of his movies. There's water versus desert. There's fire. There's, nature versus grace in all of his movies there's loss of interconnection you I, know i i did like as much as he films nature just like in a spectacular fashion he did the same when it came to those those city settings i think he where he, he focused on the lushness and the water and all the natural, like, like you smell everything, everything's very tactile. And then once you get to the city settings, like in Song to Song and Night of Cups, it is very much that concrete jungle. Uh, it's very stark. It's very cold, uh, which which does play into that isolation. So, yes, you're on to something, but like cities are deserts. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. But you get, you get to Night of Cups and, and I think he gets really autobiographical once he gets there, it, which I think is the same for song to song and night of cups. Cause those two are very similar where it's, it's very much about his, I, I think Christian Bale's character is him back in the, back in the eighties uh, during his hiatus has this success. You know, he just made two great films in badlands and days of heaven studios were probably, you know, knocking on his door to make something. And maybe he just didn't want to make the films that, they wanted him to make. So he was having that isolated introspection that he just couldn't get out of for 20 years, but it comes off as, uh, you, you know, Knight of Cups, it comes off as, as his version of Hail Caesar. It's that almost like Hollywood wank and where, it, but, but it, it seems smarter than it really is. Well, he got divorced in 78. He's been divorced a bunch of times. But, but he got divorced in 78 when yeah. Days of Heaven came out. Right. And he was divorced until basically 85. Mm -hmm. Then he got divorced again when Thin Red Line came out. That's that's very telling, man. Yeah. That's there is really something to that. Uh, he, he does seem like someone that. I, I mean, he's he's been married now for a while, um, but he, he does seem like a, a kind of Kubrickian. Um, where whatever he's he's doing and, and see this is the thing where kubrick you could actually at least if it's not from the horse's mouth you could find reports of people that are very close to him it's so hard we, we have to you know theorize everything and get into into his headspace into why he does these things because he's just so far off the map yeah you have people that are in Various states of being angry that their part was cut, and that's the people who are talking about him. Mm -hmm. You have Rachel Wise, like, oh, I got cut red, and then you have you know other people like, I'll never work with that hack again. And some people like maybe you give Christopher Plummer a GoPro, he's gonna tell you to fuck yourself. But like <laughs> Christian Bale is into it. Yeah. Hey Christian, why don't you take this GoPro and wander into another movie that I'm shooting at the same time? He's like, All right, Rad, I'm about it. So, like, you, you have different kinds of people that would like, that's why Kubrick was so selective with who he picked. Because if you put anybody other than Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman, who were super into it, through what he put them through, making eyes wide shut, you, you could have broken some people. Sure. And he, and he did break them. Absolutely. So it was as much finding the kind of people that wanted to make the kind of movies he wanted to make. And that's who he's working with now. You, you don't need a ton of dialogue. If you're going to use Ryan Gosling in a movie, you don't need to write a script. He doesn't no. say shit. He's Ryan Gosling. Yeah, he just looks at the camera. Reference prove that. He doesn't say shit in any of his movies. Well, 
He yeah. doesn't have to, man. He's Ryan Gosling. He's like, hey, I was casting the notebook because they wanted a plain looking dude that would just look ordinary. And then women are like, I want to sit on that dude's face. <laughs> he looks like I have an ugly face and a super good bot. Yeah. Well, they, they cast him to be just plain. He doesn't, he's not ugly, but he's plain looking. Yeah. Every- women are like, that guy's gettable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then they watch Drive and they're like, they're like, I'm not into Gosling. And then Rachel McAdams, like, I'm into Gosling. And everyone's like, get away from my man, bitch. <laughs> It's funny how that worked out. So now Gosling just doesn't even have to talk. He just looks at the camera with his sleepy little half asleep little blink he does. And that dumb smile. Just, mm, I'm Ryan Gosling. And then women are like, ah! Just slide out of the theater chair. I get it. I'd blow that dude. Whatever. So. Hey, why not? Uh, and Ro- Rooney Mara is very much like a, a Terrence Malick. I mean, you need a an ambient style actress that just yeah. kind of sits around and looks introspective i mean she she's your girl uh, again very very plain jane i mean she's a billionaire she's part of the the rooney uh uh or the mar the mara family they're oh yeah, i thought she was part of the rooney family. like yeah the paper chinese family. oh no <laughs> no the football dynasty family yeah she's like a great granddaughter or something but she's very plain looking she looks pretty obtainable but she just has that thing about her where every guy's just like hey you know you're kind of weird and and quiet you're it's that like daria effect where everyone wanted to get with daria back in the day it's how good rooney mara looks is so dependent on her haircut it's scary (laughs) i've never met a person like her that she could go from like Uh, a three to an eight with a haircut sure yeah uh girl the dragon tattoo she needs Right, have eyebrows in that, so I was like, "Ooh, I don't yeah." Know. And I was like, "Oh, that's, that's the worst." Thing. And then you see her, you're like, "Oh, she's super hot most of the time." <laughs> that's uh, so weird. You make her look like uh, she's half a die word, and I'm not interested. Sure. <laughs> the, the actors that he did get to buy into his BS, like, uh, oh, what? Stop it. No, I'm saying like a fast bender, like uh, buy into his BS. Uh, no, they, they shared his vision. Dude, let's be fair, man. Christopher Plummer has been doing this for a very long time. I'm, yeah, I'm he's thinking. a dinosaur. Christopher Plummer's the kind of guy that if you asked him to do a CGI movie and he had to talk to a tennis ball on a stick, he'd cry. <laughs> oh, this isn't what I got into film. Yeah, I get man. it. It is not that, whatever, man. <laughs> like, I'm not making fun of Gandalf. I'm just saying the guy's old. <laughs> That's Ian. The guy's fuck. I didn't get an acting to talk to a tennis ball. Well, <laughs> this is your scene, dog. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, Christopher Plummer's gonna be like, I didn't care for it, but like, you get Wes Bentley, he's like, shit, yeah, man. So this whole movie is the plastic bag scene from American Beauty. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right, that dude cool. made a living off of that scene, so of course you cast <laughs> Wes. Bentley. <laughs> <laughs> it's a two-hour plastic bag yes let's do it finally i got something to do yeah he's like are people gonna like this he's like this is gonna be in 11 theaters <laughs> oh. it was knight of cups made five hundred thousand dollars yeah and like people keep giving him money because he makes good movies man he wins awards you should make you should be in the screensaver business because i mean everything is visually flawless i mean he makes water look more enticing and more therapeutic. Like you don't even need to mas- like a masseuse or uh, anything after this. You, uh, you just go to a Terrence Malick film, shut the sound off and you're okay. M- maybe put on like, like one of those sound generators, put on like a rainforest, you know, sound. So, so you get that, you get all the ambiance and just watch everything. And it's perfect. Stop but, it. You, you crank the sound on these movies, man. Oh God. You Maybe. crank the sound. They're like, you want to watch Night of Cups? You crank that sound up. Does that sound familiar? You know who else said that? Mr. Paul Thomas Anderson. You know, when you watch hey. Honest Drunk Love, he said, mess with the settings on your TV until the blue on the suit bleeds at the edges. So it's very fitting that during our Paul Thomas Anderson review, I cranked the gain knob all the way to 10. I was just trying to, to heed the man's advice. He yeah. is an Oscar winning director. And uh, he doesn't know shit about sound production. So thanks for nothing, Paul Thomas Anderson. <laughs> thanks for ruining our first. Uh, Dick, that was our first episode. Could have been, could have been good. 
that was a great episode too. Uh, we'll, we'll redo we'll it. We'll redo it later now that we know more about movies and how to work uh, the blue Yeti. <laughs> Very simple elementary things. Yeah, right. It's the it's like everybody loves this podcasting microphone because there's only two knobs on it. You can't possibly screw it up. <laughs> and I'm all, which one is left? Yeah. Oof. So I don't you know. Gain? Man. I would love to gain some success. <laughs> <laughs> Thought that's what it did. So. I, I don't know. I feel like I feel like visually he's got some motifs and I've Badlands kind of sticks out because it was the one movie that I thought was weird and that he never really used establishing shots of his characters. It was almost hard to tell where the characters were because he was really tight on the characters. And I think he was trying to show some subjectivity sure it it's a weird way to show pov while pointing at someone's face yep yeah and i don't know if he did that on purpose or like because he was new but for whatever reason it was very effective he does wide angle real long longer than necessary panning tracking wide shots to establish the environment even in Badlands, he did that a little bit. He'll show the the environment because very much in his films, the nature and the environment are a character and the nature is nature is not always the environment. They are for a lot of them. But like you look at his later films, it's all in cityscapes and. The, the city's basically deserts and he yeah. contrasts as against literal deserts, which I think is is interesting, but. After the Badlands, he, he mostly just just establishes really wide angle lens shots a lot. And he tends to shoot people from behind also below them. Yes. For whatever reason, it makes them look bigger. It makes it look like you're experiencing them subjectively. Like it's almost like you are a POV character. Which seeing these is people. so effective. Yeah, very effective in his films. Uh, there's a lot of like laying on your back, stargazing shots, uh, even like a lot through like uh, light through the trees, uh, which which is great. And then like something like that happens and then someone says something in a voiceover and ruins the mood. But uh, I, I thought Days of Heaven was probably his most coherent and Hollywood-esque film. And I, I loved it. It was like, it was like you go to a party and it's just like, you can only make, a, like everyone put things into a hat and it's just like, you could only make films in a setting in a wheat field. And like, that's what he did. He's like, oh crap, how am I going to make this interesting? And he just, how did. do you make a farmer interesting? And it was stunning. I thought this was one of the most, like the locust scene, the fire, uh, everything about the fires. Uh, that's a real motif uh, too. Sure, the sure. burned down farmhouse in Badlands, the, uh, the torching the village in the thin red line. Yep. You know, that's, uh, a lot of that too. It was a. It's it's almost like he uses it as like a stringency, like a cleansing of something. Um, well, that's that's nature at its its purest form, right? The, sure. The harnessing the pure destructive but rejuvenatory power is rejuvenatory a word? Sure. Rejuvenating power of nature, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's a reset button. Um, yeah. And it's just. God. Which is why he throws so much footage that he shoots into the fire. Days of Heaven was was fantastic, man. Even like the actual. Di I'm not the biggest Richard Gere fan. Um, well, and, I think Days of Heaven is the movie that made people want to start banging that dude, right? Probably. Uh, it it wasn't not Dennis Leary, whoever the other guy was in the film. The whole time, like that's not Dennis Leary. Because um, what did he even do before that? I think TV stuff. I don't think he was any in any movies before Days of Heaven. I think he was like a catalog model. He was like the seventies version of like David Duchovny. Um, That's funny. Yeah, he was just like a calendar model. Oh, he did Looking for Mister Goodbar before Days of Heaven. Oh, that's something. Yeah, but that that film, man, um, it took me a while to to realize that they weren't brother and sister. So I'm like, this is the Lannister film. Whew. Oh yeah. Yeah, that was real weird at first. But I'd seen Tommy Boy, so I knew the con. Ah, 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> that that joke makes a lot of sense. Yeah. That's funny. Uh yeah, it was oh, man, that that film it, it it had a real tension to it the whole time. Uh you had this this weird triangle. I I thought the See, this was the the most effective voiceover was in that film because it was, it was mostly from the little sister and maybe it was just like her little you know i'm from yonkas kind of uh like yeah. accent, even though she's from chicago but chicago yeah she was from chicago but it, it just worked so well like because she was she was basically the narrator of the of the entire film uh because she wasn't she didn't interact a lot with everyone else she was just kind of hanging around you know getting picked up and thrown around by her brother and uh, she was just kind of along for the ride. And I think that was a perfect use of voiceover. I, I think it was it was awesome. And then you get to a thin red line and we're, we're in some gruesome shit. And then it's like flashback to this character that's going to not be relevant in two seconds. Him and his girlfriend rolling around on a bed in a stylistic way, wasting my time. You love him. Yeah. He made good movies. What can I say, man? Uh, OK, well, that's a question. Who would you recommend these films to? Someone who appreciates film as a visual medium. Sure. And uh, I don't know. The voiceover is going to be kind of jarring, I think, but you just got to you got to get through it. I think if I'm going to crap on a movie, it would be The Thin Red Line, which is his most famous and critically acclaimed movie. I think everything that everybody liked about this movie was what was wrong with it. The actual war. Yeah, it wasn't. I mean, the fact that he was adapting a novel like he's going to tell that story. He told the story of the novel. And then in editing, he's like, no, I want to do something different. But you still ended up with a lot of good. Here's a war movie stuff just by virtue of having shot an adaptation of a novel. Yeah, so I mean, but Kubrick did that with The Shining, and I think the film probably turned out, I don't know, arguably better for. It. I, I again, um, yeah. I, I think he should have followed King's uh, direction a little bit more as far as the story goes. But Kubrick was well, able to do that. He was just like, I'm going to take this book and I'm going to make it this, and it's going to be a masterpiece in film. And then if you like the book, then go read the book, and that's its own thing. Where Terrence well, Kubrick did a lot of books. Yeah, he, he would always do adaptations where I think Malik only did what one or two in the Thin Red Line in the New World. So I it it just seemed that Malik when he Kubrick had other ideas uh, as far as go veering off the the main road, going on a separate vein. He had other ideas to still make a good coherent film where Malik always kind of went back to the go to, you know, just commentary on isolation and introspection of where, where what is my place in this world what am i doing now i have no future my past is it doesn't matter i'm i'm i've gotten to a certain place in life but it, but it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things anyways because we're all just floating in in space and gliding into each other so it's like he always did these he always had these ideas but they always went back to w one thing and where Kubrick was able to veer off and still tell a compelling story. I argue he did tell a compelling story, just maybe not as literal as people might've wanted. Sure. I think he told the same story a lot of different ways, which is something Kubrick never really wanted to do. Right. Yeah. He... I wonder if we'd done a different director right before this, if we would be making parallels that really don't need to be made necessarily with whichever director we had. That's fair. Um, it's possible we would, and it's possible we would. Maybe we're seeing connections that aren't there, but maybe we're not, because I, I feel like they both, at least at, in at the beginning, were very careful. And like to the point where nobody wanted to work with Malik anymore. They were just canceling his projects because he was taking so long. And people became obsessed with Kubrick, whether they were he was nice to them or not. So, yeah, same kind of thing where Malik won't do interviews either. I think it was no mistake that we're making these connections because I think they're there. There's a lot of similarities uh, in person and in film style. And I think that if Malik kept making films like 
I don't want to say like he was supposed to because, you know, whatever. I'm glad that he's making what he's making. Uh, if he still made more traditional films, I'll say, he could have gone down as, I think, the next, or, you know, the, the next Stanley Kubrick or at least a peer. Um, but I think ultimately it's just like, if you walk into a room with even people that are interested in film like we are, I guarantee 99% of them are going to say, yes, I know who Stanley Kubrick is. I know who Steven Spielberg is. I know who Quentin Tarantino is. And they'll name off at least five to, to eight of their, of their films where you ask who Terrence Malick is and what he's done. You'll get maybe 35, 40% of the room, even knowing who he is. And then maybe even less being able to list off any of the films he's done. I mean, what does that mean? What does it matter? Who, who knows who cares, but we, it, it means we get to feel superior to the sixty percent of those people in that room that <laughs> say they love films, or like, oh yeah, well, have you heard of Terrence Malick? <laughs> have you even seen the director's cut of Bicycle Thief? <laughs> oh god, <laughs> yeah, it's, I thought there was an extended version of the New World, and I'm like, no, pass. Oh, just take theatrical, please. Uh, that was that was a great movie, though. I, I mean, seriously, if I'm gonna recommend. Any of these, I would say New World and Before, because I think all of them are great. Thin Red Line has major problems, which I agree with you. Uh, it is an editorial mess, but it is there is a masterpiece in that film that's worth seeing. That's that's even worth sticking through the belligerent Nick Nolte and some of the the you know, schizophrenic editing choices. Nick Nolte was such good casting for him to play the role of Nick Nolte. <laughs> They should have just went full Gary Busey. Like, just said F it and just go completely direct. They say there's a thin red line between sanity and insanity. <laughs> the line remains. But Gary Busey's over on this side of it. Right. He was doing Quigley instead. He couldn't make it to the thin red line. <laughs> the word now, N-O-W, no other way. Time out. To ensure measured energy on using time. The word team. T-E-A-M. Together, everyone achieves more. And that's the foundation of the bottom line for Got V Mail. He was riding his motorcycle without a helmet is what he was doing. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. a true story. That is. I feel bad for laughing. Uh, yes, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't really have much. I, I wish there was more. Um, I, I'm looking for, see, that's the thing. It's like, I crapped on a lot of his stuff, but I am looking forward to what he has coming next. I think Christian Bale's in it. Christian Bale thinks he's in it. He's not sure. Yeah, Christian Bale about to find out whether he's in it or not when the movie comes out. <laughs> he's like, uh, so Terry, the uh, the paycheck bounced. Well, yeah, you're not in the film, Christian. So. Well, there was no budget for the movie because it's only going to make five hundred thousand dollars on three screens. So we paid. You could keep the GoPro. We'll call it. We'll call it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Do you have any closing thoughts on this guy? Radagund is his next movie. Yeah, Radag Radagund. It's not even an easy thing to say. He just this is how much he doesn't want people to see his films. A man refuses to fight for the Nazis in World War II. No, oh, then Redline the sequel. I don't see Christian Bale anywhere in this cast. No, I guess he didn't make the cut. I don't see any non-Germans. Jurgen Prochnow's in it though. That's our boy. Oh, nice. He always manages to show up in someone's <laughs> one of someone's movies whenever we do one of these. <laughs> yeah. It's like the role of Prouch now. It's like if you do enough movies, he will eventually be in one of them. <laughs> uh Grant Hill's a producer, not the retired basketball star. Yeah. August Steele, Valerie Pachner, Ni Michael Nyquist. Yeah, this is this should this should be interesting. Yeah. So uh, closing thoughts, I um, I like his visual style. Film is a visual medium. I keep saying that. Maybe it's to like apologize for people that don't write well. But I think like as well as he can write and the fact that he made a living writing and wrote a lot of his movies, the fact that he just like doesn't want a script as much as he wants to just be a director as opposed to a writer and director. I, I like what he's I like what he's doing. So I, I think uh, I think he has realized that film is a visual medium and he uses it to its full extent. 
I like his uh, tendency to shoot during golden hour, which is a really magical time of night. And it's hard to do that because you get like one good hour yeah. to shoot that a day. And he makes it work. Um, I wish he used less montage and voiceover. I think montage is kind of lazy. Kind of a cop out. Yeah. Well, maybe I, I'm probably wrong. Montage can be effective. I just uh, I think it's a crutch for him. Yeah, I think he uses it too much. I think he uses voiceover too much. There's but... not one film that he does not use voiceover in. Not one. Uh, you'll never guess if you're watching a Terrence Malick film. I, visually, again, put him up against the big boys. Uh, you literally you could put him up against anybody and he probably come up on top most of the time. Um, he's just that that great of shooting scenes. Uh, the, it's almost his wide shots are almost panoramic, uh, which which sometimes it's like like I was watching some of the scenes from from the New World, and it's just breathtaking how much content he packs. And, and when I say content, it's not just like nature happening. It's it's things. It's people. It's like a lot of stuff going on uh, with, with actors. Uh, again, I, I hate to keep going back to the reference, but I go back to like when Stanley Kubrick shoots the, the ballroom scene in the shining and how he made everybody have an assignment. I, I feel like that's kind of like a Terrence Malick set uh, for, for the extras are very involved. It's very rich. Everything it's Terrence Malick films are like eating chocolate cake. You're just going to feel great while you're doing it. Chocolate cake and thumbtacks. <laughs> Chocolate cake and thumbtacks. That is this director in a very uncomfortable nutshell. But yeah, uh, why don't we go ahead and, and tell her this is a short week. So we're we're right back to it, uh, kind of catching up from the holidays. So you want to spoil who we're talking about next? It's your show, man. You go ahead. It's your show too, Jason. I'm uh, You're driving the bus, man. I'm just a navigator. Sure. Uh, we have the... Return of Ian the Kilt Maker uh, and Chris from Bad Movie Nights. Uh, they are going to be joining us to try to talk about talk about a, a train wreck. Uh, M Night Shyamalan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, it's gonna be a good one. We're not gonna agree at all. Oh man. Well, I mean, this is. I think this is the most. Uh, I don't know, combative is the wrong word, but this is the most that we disagreed, I think, on a on a filmmaker so far. With yeah. Now. Normally we have movies we like and movies we don't, but you're just like, I didn't like anything he did after 2005. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and even that was suspect. Uh, yeah, I like his I like his movies in the 70s. Uh, but yeah, M Night Shyamalan. That's gonna be talk about differences from from movie to movie. Man, there is some some greatness and some some poop in there but we will we'll talk about that next week with as we all know greatness is the opposite of poop is it though i mean <laughs> poop poop could be a great relief <laughs> you know who knows uh and by the time that you eh, maybe by the time that you see this you might be able to get catch this in podcast form so i do want to kind of uh talk about the patreon a little bit there is a patreon for this very channel they said we said if you like shows like director's cut if you like shows uh like the the cult of films and and all the the movie stuff that goes to support that uh putting all that stuff uh, uh into podcast form so if if you do like driving in the cars uh, and you don't want to look at like how you pantomime driving <laughs> driving in the cars but they would never know that once it's in podcast form oh uh, that's true yeah so if I'd said nothing, you could have gotten away with it. Yeah, thanks for calling me out, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think pantomime is the voiceover of acting. <laughs> Malik was pantomiming through his entire life. <laughs> oh, my God. That's why he didn't want to be filmed. He's like, I'm just doing some pantomime. Don't mind me. <laughs> I'm wearing basketball shorts. And Christopher Plummer's like, come on. <laughs> you watch your mouth or I'll cut your whole character. Right. Jackass. It was always he's always wearing a safari hat too. Maybe that's it. He's just like, I can't find a new hat. I just got the safari hat. And a scarf. He's a big scarf. I mean, he looks right out of like You've seen two pictures of him. Like he's always wearing that hat. Because <laughs> he's been photographed day. twice. <laughs> it's the exact same day. Like, shit, that's a weird coincidence. I've worn this hat in seven years. People yeah. are gonna think I wear this hat all the time. 
<laughs> nope, just John. Yeah. I just found this hat. <laughs> too bad John has a podcast and talked about it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Would have gotten away with it too. We're in a hat <laughs> literally two times in eight years. Got you back for the driving pantomime. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> sure. All right. That's it. Uh, hey, Jason, where can people find you? I'm on the Twitter at Jason Yell. You should follow me on Twitter because uh, every time I follow, I get a follower, um, my number of followers goes up. And um, math. the more I get, the more I can berate brands on Twitter. They're like, hey, I didn't get enough fries, Wendy. They're like, oh, no, he has 5,000 followers. So they do what I say. So please help me be able to berate Wendy's. Follow me at Jason E. Alt on Twitter. Uh, I'm the host of a couple of podcasts. Um, yep. It's all in my Twitter bio. Just, just check me out there. Don't come by the house. I'll pretend not to be home. Twitter's wow. the best place. Unless you got a good beer, right? I don't know. Uh, yeah, don't go to Jason's house. Uh, what am I drinking? I'm the sister, man. This was good. I'm going to talk. If about you don't it. remember, that's quite a, an endorsement. The Fremont. This is all that's left, and that's about to go down the gullet, too. But yeah, no, that's about all I got left of my one can of hazy IPA. Ooh, yeah, nice. Let's slam it. That's that's entertaining. So this is the ASMR portion of our podcast. Mm. Ooh, that beer was malty. Yeah, this is just getting. I'm crazy. just gonna make lip smacking noises. <laughs> we get so many more followers than we have now. <laughs> yeah, go go to Patreon.com. Uh, they said we said support the show. All right, we'll see you at the movies. We'll see you next time. We're gonna talk about Shyamalan. We'll see if the movies with such a good heart out. And you're like, no, I'm going to keep talking. <laughs> like, you almost apologized for it. Like, we'll see you at the movie. I mean, we'll see you next time. Fuck, I shouldn't have said that.